Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tao Reed Lagbaja, yesterday declared that the military establishment remained committed to defeating insurgents, armed bandits and other non-state actors troubling the country. Lagbaja reiterated the loyalty of the Nigerian army to the country's constitution and President Bola Tinubu. His comments come as troops sustain the onslaught against armed bandits in Zamfara and Katsina state, killing 11 bandits. Lagwaja, in his goodwill message at Easter, said the military was committed to rooting out non-state actors on settling the country. He said the Easter celebration, and I quote, reminds us of the duties and sacrifices we must make towards God, humanity, and our beloved country, end of quote. Consoling the military on the recent deaths of their colleagues in Delta State, he urged them to remain committed to the discharge of their duties. All right, we we'll fight. The um, Easter messages haven't ended. This is this one is from the Chief of Army Staff, and um, I must say, very encouraging and positive message in there. What your take on this story? I mean, it's needed uh, at a time like this to be able to rally the troop and also owing to what happened, where the military lost about 16 personnel, 17 personnel uh, in the community in Delta. Uh, investigations are still on as regards that we saw you know, what resulted from that. But we'll also like to enjoy the military to remember that this is a democratic government. Uh, it's no longer the days of a military era. Whatever you do, you're still subject to the constitutionally laid down laws of the land, which also ensures that everything must go through a legal process in accord with the laws of the land. So, because we've heard a lot of things that happened as a result of the incident in Okwama, I mean, uh, a lot of people have been declared wanted. So a lot of people are also asking what legal processes were taken as regards that. Now, I think the wife of one of the traditional rulers that, that uh, went to submit himself yes. okay. and also from, to the police now handed over to the military. And, and that's, I mean, I don't understand how that works. The police is supposed to take over the investigation, but after submitting to the police and now handing them over to the military, so, uh, but apart from that, I think the trust of the message today, is this Easter message, and the military also make very bold claims about, you know, gaining grounds in Zamfara area, which is very good, which we're very excited about. When they do well, we commend them. Also, uh, pretty much talking about the essence of the season. Yeah, that's also very good. It's, 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 it's in tandem with the realities of our time, you know, the resurrection spirit, Easter season and all of that. But I think what is paramount is the military, there's, there's a need to reiterate the rules of engagement. Or properly, how do we even as civilians even understand the rules of engagement in the engagement with civilians? That's number one. Number two, how can they bolster military-civilian relations? One thing I can tell you for free, all of that that's happening in Okoma and those other communities does not bolster military and civil relations. Because in fighting banditry and reading society of crime and criminality, you need a lot of intelligence, which people will give you. So let's just do what is right. Once again, commiserations to the families of those departed at a time like this. All right. Okay, the chief of army staff, uh, you know, Lieutenant General Taurid Lagbaja, issuing also an Easter message, just like everyone else you know, governors, senators, lawmakers. But his uh, own message, you know, bears a special significance. The first Easter celebration, shortly after the killing of 17 soldiers, uh, 17 of his men in Ukwama, Delta State. And then, you know, other challenges being faced uh, by the uh, military. So it was in order for him to wish everyone and the troops Happy Easter. And he made a number of points that I think are fairly straightforward. One, he restated the military's commitment to the Constitution, loyalty to the Constitution, and also loyalty to the President. Well, that's what the Constitution requires the uh, 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 military to do, to be loyal to the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And the functions of the uh, military are properly spared out under the Constitution and also in the Armed Forces Act, which is simply to protect and defend the territorial integrity and sovereignty of uh, Nigeria. And in Section 217, sub 2, 
to come in aid of civil authority uh, when called upon to do so. Well, in that second part, you know, what we have seen is some form of abuse, whereby the uh, security situation in the country is so dire that you'll find uh, the military being used, you know, from the Delta to the Savannah uh, to do police work. We are hoping that, you know, um, while the uh, military continue, you know, to help Nigeria to secure this environment, that the Nigerian government will also see the need not to overstretch uh, the Nigerian military and expose them uh, to uh, uh, excessive uh, uh, danger or challenges in terms of their operation with civilian uh, authority. The second point he made, of course, is loyalty to the president. Well, I mean, the president is commander-in-chief of the armed forces, and part of the tradition of soldiering is loyalty. Then he talked about the welfare, that is committed to the welfare of the soldiers. And I think that's something that the troops would like to hear, you know, that the barracks are in order, that allowances are paid as when due, and that due procedure is followed. And he talked about training. He talked about, you know, ensuring uh, that uh, needed equipment is provided, given the scope of the uh, work that uh, the military is engaging. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a no-brainer to say that they would need uh, very uh, strong uh, equipment. And then, of course, the opportunity was used uh, to, uh, you know, state what the uh, military is doing in Katsina State, in Sanfara State, and in other parts of the country, fighting banditry, insurgency, and uh, terrorism, you know, which is what has become the major task before the Nigerian military at this moment. He used the opportunity also to commiserate with the families of the fallen soldiers, the 17 uh, that died, and that, you know, they are committed to getting to the root of the matter. As for the issue that had come up about the persons that were declared uh, wanted, well, I have made the point here again and again on this program that it's the responsibility of the police to investigate, to arrest, to prosecute in matters like this. The military can only deal with his own officers when they, you know, go against their own law, martial law, and that's why, you know, the military has powers to cost martial. But the defense that the military can put up in this particular instance is to say that, oh, they've been given uh, direct, uh, you know, uh, instructions by the commander-in-chief. But at the same time, you know, the rule of law has to prevail. The uh, military, in trying to resolve a problem, cannot resort to jungle justice or take the law into his own hands. And there have been, you know, uh, established cases cited by Femi Falano, SEN, whereby, you know, uh, civilians went to a court and said the military cannot, uh, you know, cannot take them on. They should be, you know, tried by the uh, police. But these are issues that may arise from, uh, from uh, the, uh, uh, the persons being declared wanted uh, by the uh, Nigerian uh, defense uh, headquarters. But it is up to the persons involved, of course, to insist on their rights. And to the extent that the military through uh, General Agbaja is saying that they are loyal to the Constitution, then that must go the whole way in terms of respecting the rule of law and not usurping, you know, uh, powers that have not been granted to the military, both under the Constitution and under the uh, uh, Armed Forces Act. We join others in uh, wishing uh, members of the, uh, uh, the Armed Forces a very happy Easter especially now that we have all <laughs> moved out of the holiday mood. Yeah. We are now back to, uh, work. Back to work <laughs> you know, today. looks like the chief of army staff delivered his uh, happy Easter message a bit too late, <laughs> but it's okay. He's still uh, welcome. Better late than never. And absolutely true. I'd like to center on, on one of the things he said, um, like Dr. Abati mentioned, he highlighted a few obvious things in terms of his Easter message to not just Nigerians, but particularly to his troops. 
And the part I'd like to center on is an area of training and welfare. And I think this is quite important, especially as it has a direct impact on personnel motivation, especially when we talk about a demotivated military or armed forces in many instances. And this is a call to remember many promises made to military officers, especially in looking forward to or looking at the welfare scheme of the military in Nigeria. So cases around um, housing, healthcare, infrastructure, capacity development, training, which in number of times we hear that they feel um, not as equipped and even provision of, of weapons as well. These are certain areas that I'm hoping that under his philosophy, in, in direct quote to what he said, in line with my command philosophy, to transform the Nigerian army into a well-trained, equipped and highly motivated force towards achieving our constitutional responsibilities. So the military is responsible and loyal to the Constitution and the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Can Nigeria also be loyal to its people who, in many instances, pay the ultimate price in the discharge of their duties? In doing this, we must also remember the indirect you know, impact of their service to their family members as well. I recall when the president made certain promises during the um, burial of the slain soldiers in Okwama. He had said, made promises to children of the deceased, family members of the deceased. And he brought out even, you know, a cause for others who have lost their lives in the course of duty. And sometimes how their family members are treated shabbily, where some of them are asked to vacate the official residence of the slain soldiers. So these are things that we must look into in spirit of celebration of Easter and the um, Chief of Army Staff's commitment to um, training and welfare of the officers. Truly, I mean, we can say a number of things about military officers, but they do a lot of, they, they pay in many instances their ultimate sacrifice and they do a lot of work. And oftentimes the welfare system in place is not commensurate to the amount of work or sacrifices that they make. So who is speaking on behalf of not just the top brass, not the, just the generals, but the officers, the low ranking officers, those who are sent to the battlefield, those who are not motivated. We saw the video trending a few months ago with one soldier who had come out to say that he didn't have the motivation to go back home because he didn't have any money. There was nothing left for him to go back to his family to. We shouldn't, this should never be seen in terms of the optics or in terms of the reality that these men and women face in the, in the course of their duty. So I'm hoping that this Easter message in line with what the Chief of Army Staff has said, said the right things. Number one, remember that hopefully um, the Okwama soldiers have begun to see, their family members have begun to see some of the promises made by the pres President. But beyond that, the other soldiers out there, that we won't need to have them die before we begin to talk about welfare and compensation for them. Move on to our next story. The management of Gerigu Power PLC has restated its commitment to Nigeria's power sector, stating that the first listed power generating company on the Nigerian Exchange Limited was determined to support President Bola Tinubu's power sector reforms. In showing commitment to Nigeria power sector, the company took a significant step to align with new standards amid attainment of ISO 9001 and 14001 certifications from the Standard Organization of Nigeria. Speaking at Tulsa annual general meeting, independent non-executive director of the power generating firm, Doron Gupa, stated that the company has invested $550 million in plant transformation. At the AGM, the shareholders approved the board of directors' 20 billion naira dividend payout for 2023 financial year, re-election of two directors retiring by rotation, and authorized the directors to fix the members of the auditors, among other resolutions. Speaking to stakeholders or shareholders, Chairman Girigu Power, Mr. Femi Otedola, stated that the 20 billion naira dividend payout was a testament of the company's strong financial position and dedication to delivering shareholders value. He noted that 2023 was a year of solid financial performance for the company, underpinned by strong commercial momentum and strategic operational efficiencies. Well, shall I say congratulations are in order to Gary Power. Uh, Rufa, your take on the story. I mean, congratulations are in order to Gary Power. Also, congratulations are in order to Femi Otedola. I mean, uh, a lot of people have shouted him to be the man with the Midas touch, you know, because prior to this time, power companies were not this fashionable in Nigeria, owing to the historical antecedents of NEPA and the likes, you know. In fact, there used to be a moniker for NEPA then called Never Expect Power Always. Um, people will say, PLC, never PLC, then they put forward and say, please light candle. 
you know. But, you know, since we had the privatization of most of these companies and people buying into them, now we have power companies that are now quoted on the stock exchange. Femi Otedola led the way on that. Uh, Tony Olimilutu is on the stock exchange now, and these companies are posting very good numbers on the stock exchange. And it's very evident, you know, that a company like Urigu is posting about 20 billion. That's a big amount in dividends. And also show you the strength and the capacity of thinking, you know, behind Kirigu and the professionalism behind Kirigu and the level of investment that I've been putting into. I mean, you saw the number spec over 500 million. I mean, with initial investment of about 100 million euros, and that has only increased. So, what we'll all just say is congratulations to, you know, Kirigu. Congratulations to the doggedness and, uh, you know, uh, the very innovative thinking of uh, Mr. Femi Otadola, you know, constantly blazing the trail. Uh, a lot of people thought he would not be able to do it when he said he was going to segue into from oil and gas into power. But he pretty much saw the light, you know, before most people. And he didn't just segue into power, then he brought it onto the market. And it's been running a very viable company. And that's why, you know, top stakeholders, you know, around the world are part of Girigo. I mean, we saw the African Development Bank the other day yeah. picking up some shares in Girigo. So it can only be up, up, up from, uh, from here for Girigo. And uh, we, we would like to now see how this translates to the general power sector and how we can start to solve the power malaise. You know, because the problem is, it's not that these companies like generating companies are not pushing power onto the grid, but the problem is how we be able to revamp the grid in such a way that we can distribute power effectively through the discos and also get the metering system right and many things across the power value chain, you know. So there's a call for uh, a grid fixing, as it were. You know, we had that deal with Siemens, but we don't know how it's panned out over the years. All right. Okay, congratulations. Uh, first, personally, to uh, uh, Femi Otedola, the chairman of Girigu PLC, the man who has been described as the Warren Buffett of Africa, uh, an activist investor uh, who has uh, acquired a reputation for transforming companies and business operations. Uh, he went to a First Bank of Nigeria holdings. The shares jumped up. And also with Gregu PLC, he took Gregu PLC to the uh, Nigerian Stock Exchange, and market capitalization of that com company jumped, you know, uh, about eightfold. You know, profit level jumped, you know, about 46 percent, uh, up to an extent now that as of 2023, the occasion that brought up this story is the annual general meeting, you know, of the company where it was reported, of course, that a company is doing very well, so well that it has given out 20 uh, billion uh, naira in terms of dividends at uh, the rate of eight naira per share. So this is delivering value uh, for, you know, uh, shareholders, for investors, and beyond profit, you know, the occasion was also used to talk about, you know, the strength, the health of the, uh, of the company. And I guess that there are perhaps uh, lessons uh, that other players within the Nigerian electricity industry, you know, can learn from the example of uh, Girigu. But what I find particularly uh, interesting was the uh, non-independent director who spoke there, uh, talking about the company's commitment to the Electricity Act of 2023. You know, the details are clear, but of course, everybody within the uh, electricity value chain will be expected to operate within the province of the law and to respect the law. But for that to happen, then, of course, government also must play its part. Now, we're told that Gregor PSC is planning to increase capacity to about 1,300 megawatts. And it was in that context that the director was talking about, you know, the uh, investment that has been made running into uh, uh, about $550 million dollars and about uh, 400 you know, million uh, uh, euros, and the promise to include more investment. But there was a line in what was saying about government playing its own part. Because for businesses to thrive, be they power companies or, or you know, uh, uh, supermarkets, they will need you know, an enabling environment. And this administration continues to talk about an enabling environment. And in that regard, you know, some of the um, uncertain you know, uh, declarations by the uh, Ministry of Power in particular, you know, uh, which seem to create some form of anxiety on the part of players within the entire value chain. Now, the, beyond all of this, beyond Girigu doing well, 
is the concern of the ordinary man. Girigu is a, is a, is a genko, generating power, a, a nuclear thermal you know, uh, uh, plant, uh, generating power for Nigeria. Part of the problem within the electricity uh, value chain has been evacuation. The Minister of Power, the other day, was saying, oh, you know, Nigeria has the capacity to generate, and we are generating. But uh, transmission is part of the problem, okay? Evacuation of what is generated is part of the problem. And the discourse also, you know, are saying, look, we have issues within the industry that have not been addressed. And unless those issues have been addressed, we may not even be able to, you know, to take up to what is expected. So these are industry issues that will have to be resolved so that, you know, companies like uh, Girigou PLC that even have the capacity to even be more profitable within that axis can also take advantage of the resolution. Only the other day, the national grid, you know, collapsed. And that was about the fourth time or fifth time since January. This year alone, that, that I think is very embarrassing in a country of over 200 million people that cannot even, you know, supply electricity in a, a double digit range for, for people to use. But congratulations, as you have said, to Grigou PLC as a business. But beyond the success of companies, we also have to look at the uh, long-term you know, effect uh, within the general uh, society and economy and the industry itself. Well, 20 billion naira in dividend payout, music to the ears of shareholders who had faith in not invest and um, put in their money in the business. But beyond that, as we've talked about, we also congratulate um, very loudly Gergu Power PLC, Mr. Femi Otedola, and the staff who've worked tirelessly to ensure the success of this business in the year under review is looking forward. And that's why it was important to uh, look at some of the things spoken about as to what must be done to sustain the successes recorded by Gergu Power PLC in the long run. Beyond, because even Mr. Tadola himself said he was cautiously optimistic of the next year, just so that against all odds, the profits that have been made would be sustained and hopefully even do better in the next year. One of the things that talked about was the Nigerian Electricity Act of 2023 and how that has provided a framework for the supply um, chain to to, to flourish, especially in the electricity sector, electric um, power sector. And then also um, looking at the enabling business, uh, business environment and the ability to attract investors. One of the markings of a successful business is if investors can see potential enough to want to back it you know, with their money. And we've seen that happen with Kirigu Power PLC. Um, they've looked at um, in the past where they've been able to attract uh, um, hundreds of millions of euros in terms of shoring up their capacity. And now an announcement of even further yeah money being invested and this is a good sign we're talking about being able to run businesses as nations indigenous businesses that's able to attract the much needed um, foreign investment so this is a win on many fronts in many instances on many areas so again congratulations to Girigu Power and to the entire leadership of the organization hopefully this success, this win can be sustained. And, and like they mentioned, it cannot be done alone. The government has its own role to play um, in terms of business, enabling the business environment, and also uh, um, ensuring that the Electricity Act actually works. Move on to other news this morning. Nigeria's president, Bola Tinubu, will be attending the inauguration of Senegal's president-elect, Basiru Fai, scheduled to hold today. On the foreign scene, former U.S. President Donald Trump has posted a $175 million bond in his New York civil fraud case, staving off asset seizures by the state. This comes after Trump's net worth plunged by $1 billion after shares of his social media company tanked in its latest financial results. Also, five aid workers, including an Australian and two people said to be British and Polish, have been killed in Gaza in what the charity founder said was an Israeli attack.